seems to be seated far enough apart. <laughs> Let's begin our worship by singing there's something about that name. Keep me safe till the storm passes by.
Good morning. It's good to see everybody, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you for several weeks. It's good to see that all of you are distancing, and uh, uh, some have masks, some don't, and that's okay. It's good to see your face, and uh, I know one of these days we'll be back where we can do that, and, and we will be back to normal. I pray that they don't make this something that we have to do all the time. So anyway, Jimmy, I think we need to talk to the first group the first worship group over there. These folks really appreciate good music, don't they? They clapped. They didn't clap over there, did they? <laughs> so anyway, and I want to say thank you to uh, the pianist and the beautiful music prior to the service and then even after the service and during, and that's been a blessing as well. It's been a joy to be with you folks and to share in this time, and I pray that today we'll just be able to share together 
and that we'll be able to glean some truths from God's Word. If you haven't already turned, turn to John chapter 15. We want to talk about abiding in Christ, the significance of that for each and every one of us as believers. Now, Jesus is talking to his followers. He's not talking to lost people. He's talking to his followers. And so uh, I want you to keep that in mind. And the purpose of what Jesus was doing is that he is in the process of, of teaching and leading his disciples from their understanding of what it means from being a servant to being a friend of God. And uh, I like that new song that's come out probably 10 or 15 years ago. It talks about, I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. That God would call us. Y'all know that one? I am a friend of God. Some of you know it. Hold your hand up if you know it. If you've heard it on the radio. We got two or three. And some of you don't want to say you've heard it. Thank you. It's a good song, I tell you. And uh, that God would call me a friend. And that he would call you a friend. Not just people in the Bible as he did with Abraham. Got to the place where he called Abraham his friend. And he calls us his friend when we abide in him, he abides in us and his love. We're keeping that commandment of loving one another. And so I, as I was reading and studying, I came across several things concerning the vine and the branches. And, and so I hope that it will speak into our hearts and into our lives and that it will um, energize us, encourage us to go beyond just sort of going through the motions. And a lot of times it's churches that's what we do. Uh, I know that I've been a Christian since I was 11 years of age when I gave my heart to Jesus at 11, and he spoke into my life. I can't, didn't know what all was going on then, but I knew that I needed Jesus as my Savior. I invited him to come in, and ever since then, uh, God has just been working and growing and pruning and doing all kinds of things in my life, and I'm so grateful that one day I pray that he'll be able to call Ralph Chet a friend. And not just a servant, because the servant, he, all, he doesn't know what the master is doing. But the friend knows what the master is doing. Because he hears the master, he's abiding in the master, the master dwells within him. And so that's where he wants us to get to. And I pray that that'll be the process for us, is that in our daily lives, in our growing as Christians, that we'll not be satisfied with where we are. Please never become satisfied in your Christian walk with where you are. There's always things to learn and grow and do and see and hear God and how he's working in other people's lives, but what he wants to do in your life. And I uh, didn't share this earlier in the service, but I remember as a young preacher going to conferences and going to places, and I would hear such great music and great preachers and what they would be saying and teaching and and what they'd say you need to do in your church, and I believed them, and I'd go back to my church, and I'd try and preach that, and it seemed like it was like an anvil just falling to the ground, you know, just like, boom, and it didn't work there or something or whatever. But I'm telling you, God doesn't want us just to kind of be in limbo in our Christian journey. It's always a process of growing and getting closer to Him, and the way you do that is in abiding in him. So let's read this scripture together. Uh, John 15, verses 1 through 11. The Bible says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear fruit, or that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. <clears throat> By this, my father is glorified that you may bear much fruit. So as so you will be my disciples as the father loved me. I also have loved you abide in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. When I think about this passage, first off, when I think about I am the vine, I think about Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. And I'm not going to go all the way through the Bible, but I want you to know that Moses, when he encountered God, and he was telling God why he couldn't go back down into Egypt, and then finally it got to the place where he said, okay, I'll go. And, but then he said, who, who will I tell him has sent me? And what did God say to Moses? I am that I am sent you. I am that I am sent you. In other words, what God was saying to Moses is that Moses, whatever you need in your life and in your journey going to Pharaoh and you're fulfilling my assignment, you're carrying out what I've given to you, he said, I'll be whatever you need for me to be. I want you to understand this morning that where you are as a believer and in your growing and being a part of the vine and you abiding in him, he will be everything that you need him to be wherever you are. As a young person, as an adult, middle age, older, whatever you're going through, till the storm passes by, man, we're either going in one, coming out of one, getting ready for another one. I'm glad I don't know when the storms are coming. Yesterday in Chesney, we thought, I guess we didn't pay the preacher enough down at New Pleasant, but man, we thought a storm was coming. It were black clouds. They were coming toward our house, and it looked like the parting of the Red Sea a little bit later. They just sort of went around us. You know, they say you don't pay your preacher if it doesn't rain, and if it rains, you pay him good. So keep paying preacher Hames. And uh, so I'm sure y'all have gotten a lot of rain up here. But the thing of it is, we're going in it, we're going through it, out of it, whatever it is, that even in the midst of it, as my pastor sent me a passage this morning, I believe it's Isaiah 43, and it talks about how that you go through the waters, but the waters is not going to overcome you, that as you go through the fire, it's not going to scorch you or burn you, and all of that. I mean, he is with us, amen? He is with us, and he's for us. And he says, I want you to learn this principle of abiding in me. And when you get this principle, and I mean it really gets not just in your mind, but it gets from your mind to your heart. And then from the life that you're living, start young. Start young. I'm glad that I gave my heart to Jesus at 11. And I can remember, this may be too much information, but I can remember at 11 years of age, I didn't share it back there, but we ha I had one of the biggest sliding boards that you would want to have. You know, you put the wax paper on it, and I mean, phew, you, I mean, boy. And so I would get on that sliding board, and I would, I'd have my shorts on or whatever, my T-shirt, and I'd grab a hold of it, and I'd just be laid out on that sliding board. And all of a sudden, even as a little boy, I remember till the storm passed, and I would sing as loud as I could sing. Or I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, you know, and I'd be a singing, and I'm sure people all up, the valley up the gully, it was a gully, it wasn't a valley, the gully there on the mill hill. I mean, to, and they were hearing this little boy sing. I'm sure they were saying, would he please be quiet or at least sing a little lower. But I'm telling you, the joy of the Lord is our strength. He's in us and he says, you abide in me. And later on in the passage, he talks about he wants his joy to be in us so that our joy will be full, that it will be full and overflowing. I remember times when people would pour my drink and they'd leave about that much from the top. And I'd say, please give me a little bit more. I want it to be full. You know, not overflowing where I have to kind of, you know, get it off the top and it's running over the sides. But that's what it's all about. That my joy dwells in you, God speaking, so that your joy may be full, complete, running over a well of spirit water springing within you, as Jesus said in other times. I love how Jesus teaches and what he does. And I'm sure somewhere close by, he was watching people prune the trees, burning the limbs, doing all of those things. And Jesus always took opportunities to teach when he saw things. And so here he is, and now all of a sudden he's seeing this going on, and he begins to tell his followers, this is very important. So he wants you to know, I am the vine, you are the branches. He says, not only am I the vine, he said, I am the true vine. 
that word true was said, Jesus said it emphatically. It wasn't like, I'm the true vine. Maybe a little. No, he said, I am the true vine. Emphatically spoken to his disciples so that they would get it. I'm not false. I'm not somebody who's speaking lies into your life. And we need to be careful with that. When we're in school, all the things that's coming down the pike, things that's going to be taught. My daughter shared stuff with us that they're going to be teaching in North Carolina. And I'm telling you, mom and daddy, grandma, grandpa, you better be vigilant. You better be on your knees. You better be praying for your children. You better be asking God for leadership. You better be abiding in the vine so you can hear what the Father is saying. Where we are, what's going on, and as Preacher Haynes talking about, you know, where do we go from here when this is going on and what's happening? They're taking opportunity to, to strike down all kinds of pillars in our country and teaching our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren things that is not a part of what this country is all about, even with all of our flaws. But I'm telling you, we better abide in Christ, abiding in Him, listening to Him, getting in His Word, receiving from him what he has for us, the assignment that he has for me in school, that he has for me on my job, that he has for me in my retirement when I go to the grocery store. God, what is it that you have for me to do? And then I'll know that whatever I need him to be in that very particular moment in my life, he will show up and he'll give me all that I need to fulfill and carry out his assignment that he's given to me. That's what he wanted his followers to remember and know. Jesus said, I'm the vine, I'm the true vine, I'm real, I'm the genuine, I am su substantial in your life. Jesus is not an antidote, he is not an afterthought in your life. He is everything that we need. Jesus is all I need in this life. I need connection, I need relationships, but that's what the abiding is all about. It is about that deep, intimate relationship that you have with the Father it's about relationship with him. And then all of the other things will begin to become natural in your life. You're giving, you're going, you're serving. And so many times we get caught up in the doing for God that we forget being what he wants us to be and becoming what he wants us to become. So then it's just a natural overflow. And I'm telling you what, when you're walking in his presence and his power and in his spirit, when you do that, I'm telling you what, it's just flowing. It just goes. It just goes. It's effortless because he, you're abiding in him. He is in you. And you're, caught, you're doing what he's, calling, what he's called you to do. I'm telling you, it's so much easier. But when you get out from his will, do it, try and you still love him. And you're part of the body of Christ. And you know him. And he's your savior. You're going to heaven. But you start doing things kind of on your own. And you get a little lazy and lax on this area of your life or whatever it may be. And then all of a sudden you begin to drift away. We don't mean to, but we do. And you can always repent and return and come back. And then abiding, he's speaking to believers. He's saying, I want to be able to call you my friend, not just a servant, but I'm substantial in your life. I am the enduring one. I don't know about you, but there's not much enduring in this world. Jesus is the enduring one. He is essential. We've heard a lot of debate over who's essential in our world right now, right? Who are the essential ones? The ABC stores? Our restaurants? Our school teachers? Our politicians? Are they essential? Sometimes we go, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's all according to what they're espousing. But the thing of it is, what is essential? Jesus said, I am essential. And he says, you are essential. You're in this world for a reason and purpose. You're not just here by happenstance. You're not an accident. God has you here for a plan and a purpose, and he wants you to understand and know that you're essential. And Jesus says not only that, but he says he is eternal. Man, I'm just thinking there is nobody like me. There is nobody like me, no matter what Don Lemon says, or Lamont, ever how you say his name, or any other person that would claim the idea that Jesus is, says he's sinless, Whoever that is, Jesus, born of a virgin, born of a virgin, sinless, lived and died, 
rose from the grave praying for me right now, ascended to the Father. He loves me and he dwells inside of me. He is distinct. He is eternal. He will last forever in my heart and in my life when I take my last breath, when we leave this world, whatever it is. He wants us to get to the place of that wonderful intimacy, that wonderful intimacy of peace in our hearts and in our lives and joy and love and patience and forgiveness in our lives, the fruit of the Spirit of what it's all about in us, that people may see that in our lives. It's so important. The part of the song where it says, and then when, when we stand on that bright and peaceful shore. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, God wants you to experience that now so that when you get over there, you'll know what it's all about. Because you've got it here. When you are abiding in Him. He wants us to understand that the vine needs a great deal of attention and the vine dresser is the father. I don't know about you. My dad was, he was a product of his dad. My dad loved me and I knew that. But he didn't know how to show it a lot of times. But yet in the same time, I, you know, he'd give me a hug and I'd have to, later on, I finally got my dad to give me a real man hug. You know, because it was always that that distant kind of hug because his daddy never got hugged. He never, his daddy never hugged him. And so finally he got to the place that my dad loved the Lord. He loved his two girls. He loved me. And the thing of that is that he cared about us. And I, I know one thing, we may not have had the best clothes to wear. We didn't have all the name brand things to wear like they have to have now, you know, or drive or this or that. But my dad provided for us. And I knew that my dad loved me and he took care of me and he tried to do everything that he could to give to us what we needed in life. And uh, that's very special. In this passage, Jesus said, I am the vine. My father is the vine dresser. What comfort. What assurance. It was always wonderful to know that I could call at least ask my dad or my father-in-law or my mom, uh, my mother-in-law, yeah, I'll ask her. Whatever what she thinks, you know, to be able to ask those people that you respect and love and they've been around for a long time. Man, they, they've been through it. They've been there. They know the pitfalls of what's coming in life. So when your mom and dad begins to say stuff or do things to you and all this kind of stuff and, and you go, oh, mom, oh, dad, when you get that way, you know, just remember they've been where you are and they know what you're going to experience. And sometimes it's hard for mom and dad to let you experience or fall and get hurt sometimes. And sometimes you have to learn on your own. We had to learn, didn't we? They tried to tell us too and we had to learn and they allowed us to grow in that way. But my father... Jesus said, my father, he's the vine dresser. And he's going to take care of you. And he is going to prune and he is going to do all the things that needs to be done because I am in the vine. He's the vine dresser. I'm the vine, you're the branches. And, and man, he's going to take care of us and he is going to lead us tremendously as we grow. Now, you know that there's two kinds of branches when a vine, a vine, if it has no branches, guess what? It's not going to produce any fruit. Any of y'all like peaches? I don't know about you, but I don't like peaches that you peel and it sounds like an apple. Know what I'm talking about? Got one of those, I see, you know, you get a peach and it's like, you know. Boy, I like it when it just, you, you, you get a peach and it's just, I mean, you know, you can just get it all over your face, that kind of peach. Matter of fact, we need to go get some after we leave here. Apples that are juicy and delicious. Man, the vine is there, but if it doesn't have branches, but then if it's got branches that's not going to produce, you look on trees, and sometimes there's those branches that's growing out there, and they're not doing anything. What do they do? They come along, they prune it off so that the juices and everything gets to the other branches, and then all of a sudden, they look and they say, hey, man, we've got a real good crop of peaches or apples or whatever it is. I remember over on 85, driving down the road, and when the... Kajanos had all of those peach orchards on the interstate, and you could see them, how they had it lined up, and you could look every which way. And I mean, it was just incredible. But at the certain period of spring, man, they were beautiful, beautiful, beautiful blooms on those peaches and everything. And then 
all of a sudden, a few weeks later, you'd come by and there'd be piles of, of, of branches all on the ground along the way. And I spoke to one and I said, why do y'all do all of that? And one guy said, well, do you want beautiful trees with blooms or do you want luscious peaches? We prune them to get luscious peaches. So the thing of it is, when God prunes you, when he prunes us, he wants you to produce. He says, we're in, we're in the process of production. And God doesn't want you to be so enamored or so fixated on producing for God that you forget to abide in the vine. But it's when you're attached in that intimate, deep relationship that you have with him that that flow of him and his love and power flows through you in order that you might produce fruit. And then later on in the passage, he says that you might produce more fruit. And then later on, it says in the passage that you might produce much fruit that remains. I shared in the earlier service, I pray to God that I, over the years, have been able to share and produce fruit so that others, that, that spiritual truths have been taught and spoken into people's lives so that as they grow up, that we've made a difference, that my wife and I, in 47 years of ministry and in our lives, whether it's just being around, being Christians, that we've had a significance in their lives, that people, that, that spiritual truths have been spoken, that it still remains in their lives because they've encountered us and we've encountered them. Why? Because we have been abiding in the Father, and the Father, Jesus, dwells within us, and because of that, he's produced fruit and much fruit that will remain. That's so important that we understand. So there's branches that produce fruit, branches that don't. And it says that they will be cut down, they will be gathered up, they've withered. Listen, you can be in church and be out of fellowship with Jesus. You can be in church, I didn't say relationship. If you've invited Christ into your life and you know that you're born again and you're saved, and he dwells inside of you, you know that. But I'm telling you, when you drift, when you get lazy, and you just get whatever it is in your life, and you're not as intimate, you're not, I mean, you're not fixated on the things of Christ. And that doesn't mean you walk around like a robot all the time, and you got to, do you know Jesus? I mean, that's not it. But the real thing, the real deal, Christ changed my life. This little boy from the Mill Hill. Never dreamed he would do what he's done in my life. Never dreamed I'd go where I've gone and the things that God has allowed me to be a part of. Never dreamed that I would fail in this area and that area. And in the process, as I look back in my life, he was pruning and teaching. He was doing all those things in my life. And he's making me the man of God, the man, the Christian that I need to be, the husband, the dad, that I need to be, the grandpa, the pops, that I need to be. Because I abide in him and when it talks about abiding, it talks about to dwell, to stay there, to remain, to settle in. To settle in. To grow deeper. That's what Jesus wants with our relationship with him. The more we spend time with him, the more we want to be with him. To be in his presence. I shared in the earlier service about going to Brooklyn Tab. Any of you ever been to Brooklyn Tab in New York City? Have you ever heard of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir? You've never heard of the Brooklyn? Few of you have, yeah. Sort of threw me off there. No, the Brooklyn Tab. What God did with a lady that knows no music, can't read music, and she's up there leading those choirs. And we heard Psalm 34 the other day on the radio and we were in the car and we're in church and we'd heard several other songs and all of a sudden just the presence of the Lord begins to fill the car man and as they talked about oh taste and see that the Lord is good man and those two brothers began to sing and then all of a sudden magnify the Lord with me Come exalt his name forever. Glorify the Lord with me. And it's almost like I'm getting drunk now. Glorify 
I mean, it was in the car, the presence. It was in the car, glorified the Lord. How awesome that is. Abide in me, I in you. You'll keep my commandments. That's how you know that you're abiding in me. That you will love one another. And that you will be producing fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Fruit that remains in your children, in your spouse. They see the love, the grace, the forgiveness, the peace, all that got the love of God in your life. How did Jesus love us? He loved us how? How did he love us? Unconditionally. In other words, you don't deserve it, but yet he loves you. He loves me. He loves me. He loves you. And he gave himself that we might know him. And the power of his resurrection to abide in him. That we will produce fruit. That we will be everything that he desires for us to be. Jesus wanted all of them to know. He wanted them to be his friends more than just servants. And I pray that in my life as I read this, that I, as I come to verse 11 where it says, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy, that my joy may remain, that may abide, that's remain and abide is the same thing, that it will remain in you and that your joy may be full, overflowing because you know him. And so many people, whether whatever president, whatever person you know of any distinction or high, whether it's President Trump, Obama, whoever, if you know somebody, oh, I know this person or that person, man, you can say all of those things, people of distinction, distinction. But I'm here to tell you, I know Jesus. He knows me. He dwells inside of me. He loves me. He cares for me. His, the Father is the vine dresser. He is going to provide for me. I've got assurance. I've got hope. He is doing everything that needs to be done in my life, in, your li in our lives, and in the body of Christ. So that when the world looks and they see us, they don't look at a bunch of hypocrites and they look at a bunch of people that are just putting on a show and putting on a front, you know, and going to church on Sunday and looking good on Sunday, you know, and all of those things. But when they're in the world, they're a different individual. They're different, man. It doesn't mean anything. And the world's looked at the church and they look at us and, man, we have lost our standing. We've lost our place in the world. And God's saying, that time is over. You're now at a place where I want you to come back to me. I want you to know. You already know you abide in me. I want you to fulfill the assignment that I've given to you and that my joy will be in you and remain in you. And it's going to overflow in your life, in your home, on your street, in your business, wherever you live, whatever's going on, it will be full in your life, no matter what you face in life. And as I shared with you early on, with my rheumatoid arthritis, the fact that I said, Lord, keep a smile on my face, not that I'm having a fakey smile. You know how your kids, when you say, okay, smile, and they go, they give you that fake smile trying to get a good picture. No, that, you know, genuine, come on, smile. And then all of a sudden you see them give that good smile and take a really good picture. Oh, God, please, may the joy of you be full in me and overflow my life so that when the world looks at my life and when the world looks at us as believers, that they will see the Lord in us. And then it says, my Father will be glorified. My Father will be glorified. He will be lifted up. He will be revered. He will then, people will begin to take notice again of him when they see how we treat and love one another. Because we abide in the vine. And the Father is the vine dresser tending us. That is so, so important in our lives. I pray that you know him. I pray that you have a relationship with him. We're not talking about relationship where it talked about being burned and withered and gathered together and thrown in the fire. 
talking about those branches when he was looking. He's saying everything inside of you, everything on you, in you, around you, that doesn't, is, doesn't reflect God in your life, we're going to get it off and we're going to burn it up. You can be out of fellowship. You, you can lose the vitality of your Christian life if you're not spending time with the Lord. Is there anybody greater to spend time than with the Lord? Even his little ones. Man, the greatest time in your life is to give your heart and life to Jesus and then to serve him and to grow up. And then all of a sudden, one day, he says, I want you to be a nurse. I want you to be a teacher. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to lead music. Or I want you to be a missionary. Oh, to be at that place where as you've grown up and all of that, then you say, oh, yes, Lord, I am willing to do whatever you call me to do. And some of you need to say, I want to be the best daddy. I want to be the best mama that I can be because Christ is in me and I am in him. And I want people to see the fruit in my life. What kind of fruit are you producing this morning? Where are you in your journey? One of the saddest points and times in my life was I, I wasn't preaching this sermon, but I was talking about relationships. And I remember this little lady that I was sharing with, and, and she'd been in the church most of her life. And I was preaching on having an intimate, deep, just such, a, such an intimacy with Jesus and walking with him and knowing and having that relationship with him. And she said, Preacher, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? That's what he wants in your life. Doesn't matter who you are, where you are. God's looking at where he wants to take you, right where you are, to use you to glorify him through Jesus. I pray that for you. That you know him. And as a teenager, you stand up for him with your friends. My grandson's 19. Oh, how I'm praying for him. Can't make him. I don't preach to him all the time. But that he'll stand true to the principles of knowing Christ. And he knows Christ. And that he'll live in such a way that whoever he's with, his buddies or whatever, he doesn't all of a sudden say, well, I got to do what they do in order and act like them in order to, to get in their good graces and them to be my friends. No, if they, if they don't receive you the way you are knowing Christ, then they're not your friends. That's hard, isn't it? It's mean. That's ugly. No, that's the truth. And I pray that we as a people of faith here at MES, as Preacher Haynes comes next Sunday, and preaching to you and his heart's burning to share with you where you go from here as a congregation, that, man, I'll be able to hear and we'll be able to see the things that God is desiring to do in this area for the glory of God. Not just this building, not just that family life building. Hey, you got windows. Yay. But what is it going to be used for? May it be used for the glory of God. Use it up. I started to say tear it up, and some of you would look at me like, what do you mean by tearing it up? I'm talking about getting so many kids from around this community that don't know Jesus, mamas and daddies from the other side of the tracks or whatever, and you're teaching, pouring into their lives, and you're touching mamas and daddies that don't have anything, and you've got just about everything according to the world, and man, you're pouring into those people, and you give everything you've got. Why? Because you abide in him. He abides in you, and you're going to bear much fruit that remains because you have decided, God, do that in me and through me. But I know that only happens when I'm in your presence. And then it will flow naturally to this community. Amen? Bow your heads with me. Father, I pray this morning that you will have your will and way in each of our lives as your children. And that we will recommit ourselves to you. 
and that it will be the desire of our hearts that we bear much fruit. Not that we just get so busy about doing church work, but that we're busy about abiding in you and then following you, hearing from you, so that we will be a people of faith, a people of grace, a people of substance, people of power, of love and joy, people that have a sound mind, people that are not filled with fear. And that we will declare you in all aspects of our lives. Bless this your people. Have your way. And Father, we'll give you praise and we'll give you all the glory. For it's in Christ's name I pray this prayer. Thank you. 